it's hard to call this restoration when in fact, yeah, it's interesting in that the wood floor is the only surface in an old house that actually loses mass every time it's so-called restored. And I'm using the air quotes here uh, because you're grinding away the wood. I mean, and uh, everybody in the wood flooring industry knows this, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really become that critical until the floor has got, you know, 90 to 100 years of age on it. What is up, my fellow wood floor pros? This is Steve Diggins, the host of ATWF All Things Wood Floor Podcast, brought to you by Wood Floor Business Magazine. For today's episode, I had the distinct honor and pleasure of talking with one of the premier expert flooring restoration specialists in the United States today, Michael Purser of the Rosebud Company in Atlanta. Michael Purser has worked on some of the highest profile restoration projects in the country. We're going to talk about uh, the incredibly ingenious and masterful flooring restoration process that he developed, which has uncovered remarkably historical ink stains in the floors of the beautiful Mount Pelier, the home of President James Madison, as well as his restoring the Cortison oak floors at Henry Ford's Fairlane Estate, all without ever using a sanding machine. Today, we get to hear more about the Rosebud Company and Michael Purser's wood flooring expertise, including his recent high-profile, small-but-mighty project of uh, restoration at the iconic Fox Theater in Atlanta, which was featured in the February-March 21 issue of Wood Floor Business Magazine. You can check that story out at woodfloorbusiness.com. ATWF, baby, all things wood floors. I am Steve Diggins presenting you our rabid readers and wood floor expert, today's special guest, the fascinating, the brilliant Michael Purser. Let's get to it. All right, Steve Diggins with Wood Floor Business Magazine. My guest today is Michael Purser, Wood Floor Specialist and Preservationist. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, sir. Flattered to be here. The Rosebud Company, I think you kicked off in 73, but your father started way earlier. Give me, give me some of that. Yeah, it's funny. I was reading an article I wrote some time ago, and when people ask me how I got in the business, I typically reply that I'm a product of genetic engineering. <laughs> uh, my dad came out of the service in probably around 46 and he started the company, his company, Wood Flooring Company shortly afterwards. And he stayed active. I was talking with my brothers the other day and I think he stayed active up until about 1989. Uh, So he, you know, he was in it for a pretty long time. I've got an older brother and a younger brother and um, they, um, both went, we all went into the uh, wood flooring business. I was the last one to go in. I went to graduate from UNC at Charlotte and got a degree in economics, spent two years teaching math uh, in high school. And then I just said, hey, I want my own business. Uh, went back to Charlotte, basically just said, hey, Dad, <laughs> I know how to run the edger. I know how to run the buffer. But there are a few things that I'm missing, uh, lacking a little experience on. And so he took me on and I worked there for, I think, as best I can remember about three or four months and um, uh, you know, and then came back down to, to Atlanta and started my own business in 73. You sent me an email and we were just kind of starting to trade our artifacts. And you said, um, Hey, look, this was my dad's first contract. It, it was, must have been thousands of feet. And I remember it said, um, signed here two and one half cents a square foot. And I said, Correct. if that's 16,000 feet, you get four hundred and twelve dollars and twelve cents to do this yep. project. That's ama- amazing. I get mad at guys that don't charge a buck seventy five around here, and now they're up to five dollars. When I was talking with the people at Wood Floor Business Magazine who know more about you, which was great because then I got to go look at some of your projects, and it, it's like the the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. I started seeing projects that were related to things that I had done over the years, and you're in some other stuff that I find super fascinating. Would you? I would say that what you do is is more of a, a niche or niche thing. W- would you say so? More historical renovation? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I've always been drawn to old houses. Uh, I started my business, like I said, in 1973 uh, here in Atlanta, and I started it intentionally in a very, matter of fact, probably the oldest neighborhood in the city, uh, an area called Inman Park. It was the first developed community after the Civil War. Uh, at matter of fact, most of the, most of the um, houses were built 
on what had been the battlefield of July 22nd, 1864. And it's east of the city. I got started there, big Victorian houses, just a lot of uh, uh, really nice stuff. And I knew pretty quickly, I realized because I was going in and taking off paint, a lot of paint off floors. These houses had been, they hadn't been abandoned, but they'd been hacked up into apartments, boarding houses, the whole neighborhood had gone downhill. And eventually I realized, I said, you know, this is just not a, uh, it's not a, the best business plan to go in here and grind so much wood off no. that you literally destroy the floor. Uh, so I took an interest very early on uh, in old houses, old wood floors, and focused pretty much on that. I've never worked in new construction. I've done some remodeling, but not a lot. And uh, the, by virtue of the, by the way I started my business, almost all my contacts are directly with the property owner, the homeowner. Okay. Uh, I have worked for some contractors, but not many. So it's very much a niche um, uh, market. And, um, and I think that that's worked in my, in my uh, favor. We now have this thing that's going on. I was telling you in our area, people that are doing carpet and vinyl and things, <clears throat> they, they're in a house and somebody will tempt them with, well, can't you do my hardwood flooring while you're here? And there's a lot of money involved. And it's usually a disaster that they even get involved in something like that. Or, or one of the places was there's a franchise that teaches these people how they can do a hardwood floor without any equipment, any anything, any chemicals. And I thought, oh, I, bo I hope that's not what this gentleman's into because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have trouble with this. Because I spend a lot of my year getting those people out of trouble. And then I looked into what you were doing. It's not even close. It's your own proprietary system that you use. It was really fascinating. I was so impressed. I didn't want to ask you what it was. I don't plan on asking you what it was. But you created passive refinishing. And I have, I have, a, I have an issue with this. So what is wrong with with Georgia that one, they ruin the flooring industry by inventing a flame retardant carpet. And <laughs> two years after I pick up flooring, you invent something that you don't need to use same equipment for. So I got in in 87, 89. Is that when the passive refinishing started? Well, yeah, it's kind of hard to put a specific date on it because I, I kind of, I didn't stumble into it. I knew I wanted to do something where I could, where I would get finishes off the floor without sanding because I had gotten very involved. Like I say, I, when I say old houses, I got involved in a lot of um, preservation groups, um, some international, uh, a APT, Association for Preservation Technology, um, and, of course, with local and, and the um, National Trust and stuff like that. And I heard very loudly and clearly people were saying, you know, it's hard to call this restoration when, in fact, yeah, it's interesting in that the wood floor is the only surface in an old house that actually loses mass every time it's so-called restored. And I'm using the air quotes here yep. uh, because you're grinding away the wood. I mean, and uh, everybody in the wood flooring industry knows this, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really become that critical until the floor has got, you know, 90 to 100 years of age on it. Right. So... I had been looking for some something, and I just I did in fact stumble across it. I let some there were some people within the uh, um, chemical industry. I'd kind of put the word out. I said, "Hey, I'm looking for something. It it could not be uh, flammable. It could not contain methylene chloride. It could not be hazardous or create a hazardous situation." And I can't remember exactly who sent it to me, but I got a hold of some stuff. And at that time, I had a thousand square foot warehouse here in Atlanta where I had put down I had put down new oak, old oak, new pine, old pine, white oak, red oak. I had put, I had is about a thousand square feet and I had about ten sections that were ten by ten of all these various species and types of wood and I'd put different finishes on them. This is right about the time that waterborne fi uh, finishes were coming on the market. And that's where I did my initial kind of testing or it's like, hey, can I work with this stuff? Because it's a very different animal than we were accustomed to. And one day, I, and I got this product, and um, and I was walking into the show in my room, and it wasn't a showroom; it was just where I, you know, just kind of fool around with stuff. And uh, and I was, I had some moisture cured urethane on the floor. I said, well, what the heck? 
Let's just see. Let's just go to the granddaddy of them all and see what happens. Sure. And I put some down and I walked off and left it for about 15, 20 minutes. And actually, I think I'd literally forgotten about it. I came walking back by it and I just, it's like, whoa, it had lifted it. I could tell. I said, this stuff is taking it off. Right. And I just, <laughs> that was my aha moment. <laughs> and so that was probably in the late 80s, around 88, 89. Um, I kept fooling around with it in the in the warehouse because it's one thing to put something on a coating and take it off if it's a piece of furniture. Sure. But if you're in a room and that room is, I don't care if it's 200 square feet or 2,000 square feet, you know, as anybody in the wood flooring industry knows, I mean, yes, we are woodworkers, but hey, nobody touches thousands of square feet at one time and you know do, do what we do is everything just kind of changes the dynamics so i had to figure out a way to put the stuff down get it off and make it functional and you and did that, that by melting off. somebody's floor <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly where you say i think i'm gonna go for a lunch break and you, you just walk out of the house so <laughs> wait a minute i was two years behind you we we had a, we, our area was famous for fabulon it, the, the only oh, thing yeah. you could have up here was clear Stewart flooring and Fabulon, or you were never going to get in the ball game. Well, we had a lady; her husband was out of town of business, and she had them do the floors all in satin. Everything here was Fabulon super satin. We did the floor, paid us, and he came home and he he thanked her. He loved it, and she was in tears because she's from New Hampshire, he's from Massachusetts, and I said he wanted gloss, didn't he? And she said yes. And she was crying. I said, what's the matter? She goes, well, I went down and I bought Fabulon from the paint company. And I, I just, I was too embarrassed to tell you. So she got two pad sanders with her hand and she did the whole floor. It was like 700 feet. She coated it, but they gave her Fabulon marine lacquer, like spar varnish. Mm. One's the lacquer paste. It ate our whole floor. She was crying. It was bubbling everywhere. It was off gassing. Her eyes were burning. And she said, what can you do? We, we didn't have any time in the schedule. She cried so bad that we went that night and we worked all through the night and, and redid everything. And she had two splints on her hands because she had tried to get the floors buffed down and coated without her husband knowing by doing it with two Makita palm sanders. And I said, you, you, just, you just melted your entire floor, like you're saying. And what do you think we did? We took the machines out, we sanded, we redid the thing. Never thought maybe this might have been something cool to try it in the future. What is the difference when you're talking, you say it a lot, the original beauty of a floor? And I've been caught in the middle. I did a restoration where somebody said, we will not allow you to use machines in here. And you are right. They had to hand scrape the walls, which were wood. We had to hand do the floors. And it got to a point where it just we couldn't go further. And we asked them to let us do a little, like two by two. And it looked good. So for what we did, we got away with it. But there is a difference. There are some people that have to have the preservation of, let's say, screws and nail holes. And like you had, ink stains from an ink quill and animal stains, as opposed to the original, original beauty of some perfectly felled tree that somebody sanded. What you do is different than somebody taking those boards out and putting pretty ones in and making look like nothing ever happened. Explain that difference. Well, a lot of it, there is a big difference, and a lot of it, uh, I wasn't even aware of it when I started. Uh, you know, it was like, okay, I can get the stuff off without sanding, and it became a, I wouldn't say necessarily a practical option, but in terms of preservation, it was what uh, the preservation world wanted. Now, what I, what I stumbled into and learned is, first of all, if you're not sanding the surface, you know, everything is pretty much left intact. So I have, I have done floors that were originally hand scraped, uh, probably 120 to 130 years ago. And those hand scrape marks, the original hand scrape marks are still there so that you don't lose that. Now, the one thing that really stunned me was if, You've got an old wood floor, and it can be pine. It can be it can be any species of wood. That thin there's a thin skin of wood that has aged. It's oxidized. It, the UV rays have done their thing, and it's aged. If you sand it, you're going to lose it. Okay. Okay. When you just remove the coating and the coating only, you've retained that. And when you, I mean, it's like with um, 
oak, you're going to get that golden look. And with maple, the big project we did down in, uh, in Palm Beach had, I mean, thousands and thousands of square feet of maple. And maple, you know, if it's sanded, even if it's old, it has a much lighter look. But when maple ages, there is a color there that people would absolutely kill for. Right. And that, that color is retained. The only thing that you're doing is you're taking off, you know, the, the discolorations that a lot of times are in the finishes. Um, the bulk of them are, much, are pretty old finishes. Um, and so you're just getting the, you know, you're just getting down to this gorgeous aged wood. And then the final thing that I stumbled onto that I didn't even think about is um, I do a lot of work on houses that are about 100 years, well, early 20, late 19th, early 20th century. And especially in the 20th century houses, you've got them, uh, you did start getting into, a um, little later on, you started getting uh, floors that have been sanded. And what we do, when we take the old finish off, you know, the last time that floor was sanded could have been 1915, 1920. And they did a great job. And, and it's, wow, there it is. There's the handiwork of some, you know, people from long ago. And it's, you know, it's still, that's what we work on top of. That's what we use literally is our final sanding. Uh, obviously sometimes we uncover some stuff that, you know, somebody could have done a better job and we, and we may have to do some, um, you know, massaging with that but your projects it, have a lot of reveals I, I watched you do some and oh look there was a whole there was a wall here right. next thing you know what was painted over or a, a technical question for you on when you're doing your passive system and I, i've watched you do it online technically let's say it's a plank oak or it's something that's older that's gapped do you ever have any issues with the chemicals that you're using being between the cracks and interfering with the next finish that you're putting down? Does it have to be vacuumed or scraped or hand done? How, how do you clean the seams out? Uh, no, we don't. And I think that what we've done most of the time, I mean, we're going to use um, wet dry vacs to just go over that. If there is an opening okay. and we see something that's collected in it, we will pull it out with uh, a vacuum. And of course it's going to be a wet dry vac as opposed to the, uh, like a standard back. Um, at the, at, now, I was on a project once, or not too terribly long ago. I, matter of fact, I looked at the other day in 2014, house was built in 1792, um, and it had some pretty noticeable gapping in the floor. And as many old houses go, it did not have a subfloor. That's very common in a lot of these older houses to not have a subfloor. And what we figured out, I realized, I said, it's not just a matter of this chemical going down into that crack. It's going to create, I mean, it's going to go down into the basement or whatever below it because it's a liquid. <laughs> and, uh, and so I had, you know, but, so you re I realized that was going to happen. And so I just went down and they did have a nice uh, concrete pad down there. And I just simply covered things and protected it and caught it. But uh, uh, half the, you know, that's one of the challenges <laughs> there are so many variables in this pr approach that you have to think well ahead of the curve. Otherwise, you will, you know, find yourself in an awkward situation. Well, you, yeah, you say that. I, it just made me remember. We got a job because what we called the reigning kitchen. A gentleman did a second f story of his house post and beam, and he used like the inch and a half, two inch. Um, uh, it, it was a it was a tongue and groove um, spruce, I believe, and he thought, well, it's so thick this will be fine. But what he did was he ran the floor in two directions and didn't spline it in the middle. So oh. he, he didn't tell us that we were coating the floors and his wife was yelling. It was raining polyurethane in their kitchen all over their new counters because you, the, you could go straight through because the ceiling was the floor and the floor was the ceiling and it was flooding their kitchen. We had to get rosin paper and stretch it out real quick and get thinner and clean everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, he hadn't told us that he hadn't sealed the whole floor up. You you see floors like I looked at some of your videos. A lot of times somebody will bring in a piece of wood and I'll say, well, I know what date that was and I might know what area that's from. And I know which direction the floor is running. And, you know, they, they went with, uh, you know, six inch rough pine planking. And then probably in the 50s, they turned it on a 45. So at least they could decide which way they wanted to run the hardwood flooring because you didn't want to marry the subfloors. And I saw in a lot of the work that you videoed, you're right, some of it had absolutely zero uh, subflooring and some of it had the, the old plank material. You probably don't run into a plywood subfloor nearly ever. No. <laughs> I didn't think no, so. I, that, that I don't see at all. 
So I'm not going to ask your opinion on OSB board because that was pretty short-lived. Looking at some of your projects, the Atlanta Fox Theater, and I, I think I watched the videos. I watched their video, then I watched the tourism video, then I watched your video. Tell me a little bit about that project because it was it's spectacular, and we, we'll, the magazine's probably going to post a lot of photos from that. Well, in Atlanta, Georgia, the Fox Theater has become the um, iconic symbol for uh, historic restoration, and it kind of stumbled into that uh, title. Uh, it was the building was built had a fascinating history. Uh, it was built in, uh, well, it was completed in December and opened in December of 1929. You know, so it was right on the heels of the Great Depression. And it had taken three, no, excuse me, it was three million, three million dollar building. It had originally been, it was going to be the Shriners headquarters. And the Shriners kind of, <laughs> they, they didn't do their homework. And they started building and ran out of money in no time and realized, okay, we need to have somebody to partner with. And so they stumbled into a partnership with a fellow by the name of William Fox, who was probably from the West Coast. And over a period of years, he had built or he had bought, built or whatever, a couple of hundred Fox theaters because he was in the movie business. So they wanted to have a venue to show their stuff. And um, so they were the ones that picked up the slack um, and, Unfortunately, within three years, the building was sold on the courthouse steps for $75,000. But it managed to stay in the entertainment business, and they did run movies there. And what makes it so memorable, anybody... And by the way, there were... Of those 200 Fox theaters that were built or bought or whatever around the country, there are less than 10 that have survived, and they are usually pretty spectacular. Uh, and that's they survive for that reason. I was did a lot of work in Detroit uh, or Dearborn and out right outside of Detroit, and I did not get down to see their Fox Theater, but I've been told it's one of the the classics in the country. But anyway, the Atlanta Fox Theater, you know, it stumbled along for many, many years, and they had lots of people there. They had every entertainer that you could possibly imagine, um, you know, singers, comedians, supposedly FDR, Roosevelt. Uh, uh, he had something to do there, but by the mid late sixties and early seventies, and it is right downtown. Um, it was in a position where, a, may, I think it was, well, whatever one of the bells, the Ma bell used to be, they wanted, they said, we need to put up a, you know, 20, 25 story office tower and oh gosh, we need a parking lot. Well, Hey, there's that theater. Nobody cares about it. And uh -oh. what they inadvertently did was kick a nest of hornets because all of a sudden the city that had no qualms about bulldozing any old building around in Atlanta. Hey, you could, they can say Sherman burned a lot down. Well, <laughs> so I can tell you right now, <laughs> Atlanta, you know, has destroyed a lot of our old historic fabric and they did it without any hesitation. But what made this unique with the Fox is everybody, who had been there, remembered it as just such an extraordinary experience. And all of a sudden you had this groundswell of support and it just, it was this, I mean, people were just stunned because they had gone to see stuff there and they remembered it from their childhood. And when you walk in, I guarantee you, I don't care where you've been in your life. If you walk in the Fox theater, you will not forget that experience. It's it spectacular. Just, it, I, yeah. I, when I first looked at your webpage, it, I thought you had been to, um, to Athens or some place, and it was an outdoor amphitheater because it, it the architecture is brilliant, but there's an open sky, and I realized yeah. that's a painted mural right. of an open sky. You would swear that you were outdoors at night. Uh, I the, the better photos I found had twinkling lights in the ceiling. Yeah. The picture I have up right now of of Atlanta Fox Theater. People will have to go online and look at this. It is it's phenomenal, but. Tell me how many feet of flooring you did in that giant <laughs> facility. It's a pretty big place. Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, <laughs> the, the interesting thing about it, Stephen, is that uh, when they call me about doing this, you know, you know, they just, they're, it's like, they're, they need, I mean, the younger woman knew what she was doing. She, she was kind of baiting me. She said, we got a little work to be done at the Fox Theater. And I had never worked there before. I worked in a lot of other historic properties. And I, and I said, so what is it? And she said, well, there's only one 
square or rectangle of wood flooring that is visible in the entire auditorium. And it's where this magnificent old organ called Mighty Mo sits. Mighty Mo, I and it, you, I mean, you folks that are listening, if you want to see Mighty Mo, I've got I've got tons of information on my company Facebook page. I've got a lot of pictures, and Mighty Mo is about six feet tall, and probably about six feet wide, and he's down below the orchestra pit. So you're sitting, you go in there for a performance of some type, and they and then you know the PA system says, and here comes Mighty Mo, and you're like, what? And slowly this thing starts ascending. Um, out of the orchestra pit, and I mean, when that when Mighty Mo fires up his those um, pipes, it will take the filling out of your teeth. I mean, he he is one loud, you know, musical item, and it comes up. It's very majestic, and it's the highlight. Well, they said Mighty Mo had been sitting there since 1929, hadn't gone anywhere. They finally, uh, with you know, the pandemic, now they're getting all this work done inside. And they said, let's take Mo out, get him, you know, he needs to be refurbished. And he, they took him off uh, his pedestal, called me in and said, will you do this? And of course, I was, I couldn't get down there fast enough. And so when, and what was neat about it, I got a business partner, Jenna, Jenna Novick, and um, she and I went down there. Nobody was there, literally. There was some security, kind of like a ghost security uh, force there. And we just got to walk, well, I mean, we did our work. But basically, they said, if the door's unlocked, go on in. And I mean, it is this cavernous building. It has a huge cons. You're looking at the auditorium behind you. But for years, I had, I kept hearing about the Egyptian room. The Egyptian. I said, what the heck is the Egyptian room? And it's this large area that the Shriners had so that when they wanted to have a big celebration. And I'm we're talking well over the size of a basketball court. And you don't even see it anywhere. And you got to wind your way back through these passages and you walk in there and it's, and and again, it's this beautifully designed room. Uh, They had an apartment there, two story apartment. I got to go in that. And uh, I mean, it was, it's just a gorgeous and phenomenal building. Well, that would explain the minarets in the, in the architecture. It, um, I was looking at the at Mighty Mo, and I didn't know this. I it, so it elevates because I saw there was like a pit area that looked like it was full of hydraulics, like maybe for the pit orchestra. Right. So you're saying that the actual organ they could elevate it during yeah. a performance. And how? Yeah, and what, well, was he, the, what was the flooring, and how big was it? Okay, so um, the flooring was. I've got the measurements. Uh, took pictures of it. I want to say it was two. It's everything was non-standard. I want to say it was about two and a half. A two and three quarter inch wide. It was long leaf pine. It was all quarter sawn. And of course, and it is an inch and a half thick. It's hung in groove, but it's an inch and a half thick. So, you know, whoever did the design work or selection work knew that Mighty Mo, he carried some weight. Yeah. And he's below the orchestra pit when he starts. So when he starts coming up, you don't see, you don't see the organ anywhere. You can see the whole orchestra there. Right. And then he comes up uh, on the far left side of the stage out of there, just out of nowhere. Wow. And it's pretty impressive. But it's, the wood was exceptionally, uh, you know, it was it had never been sanded. Yeah, I could still see some of the milling marks in it. And the only thing that that uh, caught my attention was there were a lot of holes, pretty good size holes in the surface. And that had been for all the various uh, life support systems, you might call them for mighty mode to get the, you know, get to get the signal from the organ to the pipes, which are up in the walls. They, when you standing there and you're looking down at the stage to either side, it looks like they're balconies and there are these drapes in front of it. Well, that's where the organ pipes are. And uh, so they said, leave all of those because that's part of the history of mighty mode. Am I wrong, or did it, it look like they removed it for the first time ever? It, oh yeah, yeah. Right. Mighty okay. Mo was gone. He was. He was. He. We kept saying he'd gone to a spa. He was getting right. his. Uh, <laughs> he was getting his spa treatment. His once every once every ninety years, whether he needs it or not. Nothing hidden under there. Not a nineteen twenty nine nickels. Anything? Something? No, we didn't get down there. I, uh, Jenna was down there poking around. She actually 
she's more mechanical than I am. And she went down there to investigate the uh, hydraulic system that, um, you know, uh, propelled him up. I didn't go down there. I have two questions for you. Under that system, and let's say when, when you were recreating this one, under what's under Mighty Mo now? What did you use to finish it? Oh, um, well, I went to a, once we got it off, and I, and I, had, to, I had to get everybody there. Uh, the, they have a preservation team. And what had been put down there, it looked like um, it might have been a varnish. I'm not sure. It, it, it was pretty badly discolored. It looked dirty, just a lot of dirt. Okay. Um, they, never take, they never took any samples to send it off to try and chemically determine what it was. Um, and I just said, okay, so how is it going to be used? Obviously, it's a pad, uh, pedestal or platform for the organ. Mm-hmm. And one of the priorities was they said, we want something, as everybody always says, I want something low maintenance, but I want protection and stuff. And I have had exceptionally good experience working with what I believe the, the industry terminology is hardening oils or hardening oil waxes. And uh, I've got quite a bit of experience working with them. There's, there are a number on the market. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to mention a manufacturer's name. There's but several. I'm, and, you know, the, it's fair is fair because they're really popular right now. There's um, Craft Oil. There's Magic Oil, Miracle Oil. Yeah, and they is, tend – I've worked with them a lot. They tend to basically be uh, part silica, part paraffin, part hardening agent, part, part oils. And mm-hmm. um, basically they're a penetrant. They don't make a surface film. Right. Uh, we've used them in some really high-end houses. Uh, I saw some of the work you did I mean, for restoration. Perfect because you're not getting a plastic look. Um, you know, urethane obviously has its its purpose. If this is something that's being protected, they're not coming in with salt and sand and children's skates. This is to be preserved. I'm sure the person that's playing that organ um, isn't coming in with their golf spikes on. What, how, what was the square footage of that floor? I think at the total, uh, it was less than a hundred square feet. So <laughs> I, I love I the mean, photo. <laughs> it's so great. Yeah, I, I and I we just had a great time on the platform. The one thing that was very disorienting about it that I hadn't even thought about, um, you know, it's on these uh, pet the the it's the platform is on a on these um, pneumatic or hydraulic lifts that come straight up these metal tubes. Okay, well, and when you get up there and you're playing the organ, there's no, that's no big deal. But when you put a buffer on it and the rotating action of the buffer, yep. all, I was up there and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, what's going And the, the platform itself, there was some movement, but not much. But it was enough for an old geezer like me. To, like, I, I got to remember this. I mean, kind of plant my feet so I don't go flying over the edge. But, we just uh, did the Canterbury Lake Park carousel. It's, it was built like two years before Fenway Park was. And it's my sweetheart little project. And uh, anytime they want anything, I'll run over there. And we got it all set up. I got a crew in there. And they're doing like you're saying. They, they took all the horses off everything. And they said, we're having a problem. When my brother's on one side, I'm getting thrown off. And I go, put, put some milk crates under it. It's huge. It's the size of a building. Right. They would be edging and the, the, it would be moving around uh, and pivoting on them. Uh, it, it's crazy. I was looking at your photos and I'm thinking, all right, if I got that job, I guess maybe if you charged something fair, like $90,000 a square foot, and then the whole project would be worth it. I wouldn't charge your dad's uh, two and a half cents. It's this massively incredible. You look like like Steve Martin on stage back in the day when he had arenas, and you've got this this hundred square foot pad in this whole place. And you're probably like, this is the greatest floor project we've ever had. It was, and I just got a big kick out of it, and yeah. it gave me. And I did something, you know, you and I were talking about how needed it is to work on one of these things, yeah. on these structures. And, you know, I don't feel guilty about asking to be paid for my work. No. But I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there working on this thing. And I didn't even tell Jenna or anybody about it. But I got to thinking one night and I looked, I was kind of digging down through the Fox Theater's uh, website. And then I saw the Fox, I think it's called the Fox Preservation Institute, and I thought, well, what is this? And they're the group that oversees the preservation of the Fox Theater, but they also provide services. I know all over the state of Georgia to help maintain these old, wonderful old theaters and other old properties. And 
So I started thinking about it, and I said, you know what? I, and I wrote him. I said, hey, take that bill. Or you know what? I, I said, I submitted an estimate. I said, okay, apply that as a uh, contribution uh, from me to the Fox Theater Institute. In other words, it's kind of an in-kind or whatever you call it, contribution sure. to them instead of asking to be paid. I just said, That's hey, take that uh, money and apply it. And they and I, they, <laughs> their, their reaction was just... They were just ecstatic. They just went. They and I and I thought it, it was the least I could do. I just felt like you better watch is- out with that stuff. You never know what's coming around. I did a monastery, and it was it was from like eighteen something, and um, we threw in too. I just we had so much fun working there with the monks and and the the the, the pastor that was there and. Um, it was funny because it was Christmas and we got done and it just looked spectacular. So they invited us up there for Christmas mass and, and I brought my family. It's all candle lit and it's just beautiful, old, old, old haunted New England home. And um, the father gets up to the podium and asks me to come up and start the mass and, and read. We had never been there in our lives. I'm like, I just donated a floor. I really didn't want speaking rights. <laughs> you do really it, it, the stuff that we got talking about it, about you know being involved in things like that. It, there's a there's a whole vibe of uh, historical things. It screams out at you that there's something special about it. I wanted to ask you from just going over your portfolio. I grabbed two of my favorites, and you have a lot going on over there. Um, tell me a little bit about my favorite one. Might have been the Wren House. That's uh, Joel oh. Chandler Harris, right? I just yeah. produced my first children's book, and WFB was kind enough to put a little blurb about it in there. Well, the Uncle Remus, Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Bear stories came out of there, and I, if I'm not mistaken, and he was uh, big into public education and human rights and preserving history, and I think that house was, if I'm not mistaken, you can tell me, it was longer a preserved museum than it was their home. Right. It's a very unique uh, building. This is at, and actually, this is the second time I worked there. The first time, it, I mean, the Wren's Nest was one of the first, if not the first, project that I used passive refinishing in. And it oh. was back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. And I hadn't been, I mean, I'd been by there and been around it and I know a lot of people associated with it, but then they gave me a call and, and they said, we've got one room here and it's called the mother's room. And, uh, you're right, Stephen. And, and that's a kind of a critical thing. Harris was just totally embraced. The people loved him. He was popular during his time and he did some nice stuff to the house. And when they said, come in here, uh, they got a grant from a couple named Gable uh in in atlanta and a fella said come in here and let's let's take the paint off the floor and, which is what i had done in the dining room back in the late 80s early 90s yep. and so i methodically went through there and i did I, as i do on all my projects i just do a ton of photo documentation because i just want to keep track of what's going on and it helps me take notes and remember what i'm doing and uh, how it all turned out but little by little i started pulling off the layers of paint and you could see where um, linoleum rugs had been attached to the floor. Right. You could see where um, there were, uh, there was an addition made to the room and you could, there were different types of paint. Uh, I mean, it is the story. I mean, what I, what I, what I like to uh, tell people is wood floors probably tell some of the best stories about a house as long as they haven't been sanded, because everything is still there intact. Sure. Nail holes where the where the carpets were laid. Um, you'll see shadows of where rugs have been put, placed and linoleum rugs and stuff like that. Uh, you can see where furniture, built-in stuff, as you said, you know, walls had been moved. Sure. And so it's amazing what you can learn. And I very methodically took it off. And I, and I did do a video, and I think that's on my website, I believe. I'm not sure. But I just get a big kick out of doing that. Hello, Wood Floor Pros. This is Kim Walgren, the editor of Wood Floor Business. Did you know that a subscription to Wood Floor Business Magazine is free to anyone in the wood flooring industry? All you have to do is go to woodfloorbusiness.com, click subscribe, and fill out the quick form. It's faster than a wood floor pro pulling post-it notes off a wood floor. Well, close anyway. And don't forget to join the community of thousands of your fellow wood flooring pros by following Wood Floor Business on Facebook, 
Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, Pinterest, and YouTube. If you have a sander, nailer, or other wood flooring tool you need to sell, or if you're looking for used equipment because you really need even more tools, check out our Wood Floor Business Buy Sell Trade Group on Facebook. That's it for now. Let's get back to our conversation with wood floor restoration expert, Michael Purser. Just looking at what you did with with the home and and the floors and what they're doing there, one thing that came to mind was um, you threw out some pretty cool technical terms that a lot of people don't use. Uh, Tell us what a witness is. (laughs) I love the witness. Uh, Yeah, the witness is a... um, hmm. Okay, so what you do, you go into a structure, and I've left about three or four, uh, uh, and you go in and you take the floor as you see it, as you're presented with it, and you simply cover it, and then you do all the restoration work around it, and then when you're when you're done, you you unwrap it so that people can see this is what it start, or this is what it used to look like. Um, and it's a pretty, it's a, I hadn't heard the term and I learned it from a, uh, an old friend, a uh, fellow by the name of Lane Green. Matter of fact, Lane Green was very involved in the Wren's Nest. He, he did a historic structures report about it, but he said, he, he mentioned the first time I ever heard the term witness. Uh, we Lane used to say the reveal. And when I heard witness, I'm like, that's better. That's a lot better. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, they're fine. And I, and, and I like, you'll see them in a lot of historic properties, um, uh, a lot of paint conservation. They'll, they'll, you'll see little spaces where they'll do tests, and they'll go down layer by layer by layer by layer, and say in this era that was the room had a yellow color, you know, but the original color might have been green or whatever. And uh, you're just kind of tracing the, um, you know, what the surface has gone through. It reminded me of early engineering when um, Ford and others would, would make an engine, and then they would take with a large industrial bandsaw, they'd cut it, cut a section out, and they'd call it a, um, a cutaway or a double cutaway so that um, when they were training their engineers, they could see how pistons moved and how rings moved. It was interesting. I looked at the work you did, and there's this filthy little pile of tape and paper and i'm just can't wait for this to come off and at the end it's the it's the big reveal you take it off and there is a little piece left of everything that you had to go through to get the floor to look the way it did and how much history was was buried there again you, you could go in with a team and replace boards and make it look pristine but now you're removing it's more important wasn't important before um, Joel Chandler Harris lived there. It was important while he lived there and what happened after. Why not keep it if you're going to make it look pretty? Well, let's also show where it ended up. I thought that was really interesting of you. And which brings me to my other favorite term. I had a guy in here the other day. They had a really big problem on Beacon Street in Boston. This beautiful um, herringbone floor that was uh, it was engineered and it, it had flooded, so they replaced it, and they decided let's use an, a really nice plank engineered quarters on material. They got done, and it started to delaminate. And I was called in to see if we could do anything besides rip it all out. And uh, one of my customers walks in. I know he's a trained wood craftsman. My grandfather was a violin maker. He had a furniture shop. I, I started in furniture before I did flooring. And I grabbed him. I said, Chris, do you know what a Dutchman is? Yeah, I know what a Dutchman is. I go, well, you're the only floor guy that knows what a Dutchman is, and I need one. So I saw them in your video. Tell everybody what a Dutchman is and how it just applied to flooring, because I had never seen it in a floor before. Well, a Dutchman is a uh, – it it can be used in a number of different ways, but typically when you see it, uh, it is used to repair. It can be a defect, damage, or whatever. And within the wood flooring industry, uh, what what's fascinating to me is if there's damage, the knee jerk reaction is, okay, let's start pulling up pieces of wood. Correct. Well, if you're going to be sanding the floor, maybe that's a, you know that's an option. But I also know that many times when you do whole board replacement, because the board comes out, there's going to be a tongue or part of a groove that's going to have to be left out and you're going to be, you can create weak spots in the floor. Sure. So I'm we're my younger brother, David is the one that kind of gave me the um, uh, education in the, in the uh, Dutchman. But what we do, let's just say 
if you've got uh, a defect in the wood splintering um oh gosh a lot of times you'll see splitting along the side edge joints where you sanded away so much wood that you're you know that you get that fault line that parallels that side edge where um uh, it's over the groove and it'll just it just breaks True. and it and so you and then you can look down and there's the tongue underneath it well uh, yeah, that was a weak spot in the floor. And what we do is we will bring a router in. We take that entire cavity where it's already uh, broken and we will expand the width of it so that it's going over onto solid wood. Sure. Uh, uh, so the Dutchman is not just going to be, um, it's not going, I mean, I tell people when we put the Dutchman in there, a lot of times it will, it will span that side edge joint. In other words, sure. you know, we're in, we're not we forget about symmetry here. We are we're we're here to repair. We want to make it structurally sound. So we'll actually um, bridge either side, but we'll drop the level of the floor down usually about three eighths of an inch. Right. We come up with uh, likes. Well, it's going to be exact species, and if we're lucky, we'll get something that's uh, the exact age or close to it. And then we we uh, I've got some very good woodworkers, and they mill it up. And they put it in place, and it doesn't have to be sanded. It's going to be flush with the surface when it goes in. Sure. Um, and so you end up, we, and I tell people in advance, I said, look, you've got damaged wood here. We're going to repair it. You're going to see the damage, or you're going to see the repair, but it will, it will blend in well. You know, sometimes we can get very close to the, um, uh, the graining uh, color. Usually we do a pretty decent job of getting a good color match. But the whole point here is to preserve the structural integrity, because when you start dealing with old floors, they can just, if you're not careful, they will fall apart under your feet. Absolutely. And so that's the way that we use the Dutchman. And um, I've got, you know, again, there's, I, I try and document all that stuff and people have questions about it. And uh, I try and make sure that they can see stuff that we've done on my website and on the uh, Facebook page. When you were doing the finish work in there too, um, it, it visualize that there might be brown paint and then there might be yellow paint and it's probably all lead. Let me ask you this because I'm not familiar with this term. You used it a lot in some of your videos. When you get past the painted surfaces, <clears throat> sometimes you would say, well, now we're down to um, drying oils. Like even one closet, you said there isn't even any paint. This is the oldest thing in the house. This is a drying oil. What what is What are drying oils? Well, if, what I found... At about the time, same time I was getting involved with uh, preservation work, I started doing s some legwork, going to museums to start researching what, how old floors were finished. Sure. Uh, the winter, winter Thur is in outside Wilmington, Delaware, hands down one of the best museums in the country. It's a DuPont museum. Okay. And Philadelphia, you've got the Athenaeum. And when I was in, on, one time I was in London, I went to the Victoria and Albert. Okay. And I actually had some people do research there. Um, the drying oil is another term that I think we would probably use to describe a, a varnish like product. Usually it is going to be thinner because one of the, again, doing the research, one of the things you found out um, finishes on wood floors at that time were problematic. Sure. I mean, fortunately we've got stuff today chemically that if you put it down and conditions are good, it's going to dry and dry. Well, well imagine trying to put down finishes, you know, a hundred, hundred and fifty years ago, you know, you put it down and say, I'll be back in a week to see if it's dry. In Atlanta in the summer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Great. with humidity. So you're talking about more than likely what would have been relatively thin, had a lot of solvents in it sure. and some drying oils, the drying oil or the oils themselves. A lot of times were, um, you know, there was some teak oil used, but most of it, but linseed was a very popular uh, oil that would be mixed with solvents. And, um, uh, but they were, they were very thin when I, when I see them today, they're, you know, they're very dry looking. You have very, you don't have that much in the way of film formation. No. The floor just looks like it's, it's just kind of dry and dirty and crazy. And, flammable. and I can, and I'll, uh, we can get it up. There's, uh, that's, that's not a problem. On some of your projects, because they are restorations, you are not the last person out where typically the rest of us fight to make sure we are the last person other than maybe the trim guy or the carpet cleaner. Um, are you typically, 
you have no problem with doing your restorations and leaving it to whatever contractor is going to start messing with the home and ladders and, and tools? Uh, no, because what we do, um, and a matter of fact, it, it has it. We started doing this back uh, at the Flagler because they realized they had so much preservation work to be to be done that when we uh, were there, it was better to get us in and out. And then they would cover the floors and protect them. And then afterwards, I mean, there was plaster work done. There were structural repairs made. Uh, but the floors were always protected and i was this caught my attention and, and this at that time we really didn't have what i would characterize as the level of protective products as we do today um but a number of years later um we started seeing an opportunity where uh the logistics for having wood floors you know at the tail end was just creating all kinds of havoc scheduling wise for the contractor or whoever was in charge. And so I said, let me float this idea and see how it works. And we started, uh, we would come in and do our work and I mean, go all the way through, let it cure whatever the product was. And then we would start wrapping and covering the surface. Mm -hmm. And my last very big project was uh, Henry Ford's estate in Dearborn, Michigan. It was known as Fairlane, Fairlane which is right. two words. There was a Fairlane car, which is one. Right. But um, uh, and I went to the pre pre preservation or pre restoration meeting, and I'm you know I'm this little uh, wood flooring contractor out of Atlanta, Georgia, sitting around a table. But we started going around the room, and they were talking about sequencing, and they got to me, and unfortunately, I knew what to expect, so I went with my iPad loaded with photos, and. Um, I said, okay, folks, I said, I know this is going to sound like it's coming out of left field, but what if, let us get in there first, do all the work, the restoration work, and then let's just cover the floors, protect them. Mm -hmm. And I said, we will take the responsibility for, for doing that. Sure. And I'll use a term here my wife is fond of. She does a lot of public speaking, and she's a scientist, and she said, there's always that pregnant pause <laughs> yep. where everybody around the table is like, I mean, this is like 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm sure somebody said, this guy's been in, he's been in the bottle pretty early this morning. <laughs> and so immediately there's pushback. So that's when, okay, I said, well, st stick with me here. Let me show you. And I just started going through the slides and little by little, I, you know, it started registering with people. It's like, whoa, you know, this could be done. And if that guy gets his group and goes through, then everybody else can come through at their pace and they can do it. And, and, and I didn't make a hard sell out of it, but I had an inside track and that the guy who was at that time, he was a president of the, um, I want to say the, the found, he was in charge of the foundation. I, he and I had worked together in Akron, Ohio, on another very early project. And I knew Mark uh, Hepner from way back. And I just told him, I said, Mark, I'm going to throw this out there. And it's going to sound crazy. But I said, trust me on this. I know what I'm doing. And, and they, so the people said, okay, fine. So me and my guys went up there. That project took me five phases over a period of about three years, but we would go through, we would do it all. We were using the, uh, uh, the hardening oils, buff it in, get the place looking really good, let it cure. And then we, and then I had some people there that would cover the floors with the protective paper and where we knew that there was going to be additional work. We would put down thin pieces of what I call masonite. Other people call it hardboard. Masonite. And I've got some phenomenal photographs, you know, of the billiard room after long after we had gone and it was, they had converted it into a workshop where they had, they were storing equipment. They were, they had these massive, those big toolbox things, those uh, huge, uh, heavy weight uh, boxes where they store their tools at yeah, night. Yeah, the job boxes, yeah. Job boxes, yeah. yeah. And everything, and, you know, they had uh, saw horses set up and they were stripping French doors. And, and after uh, we got through, you know, the floors were protected. They came through and completely removed all of the windows in the house and replaced them. Uh, because at some point the University of Michigan or somebody who had had the property had changed them out. They said, no, we're going back to original. 
So they and so they're pulling out windows. All of the walls, all of the walls in the music room and in the living room were solid walnut uh, paneling. Wow. And one time Henry went away on a trip and his wife said, you know, she just said, I'm tired of being in a dark house. Don't she say had, it. Don't say it. He, he had every, every, the music. Henry came back and the walls, the solid walnut paneling were painted white. Painted white. Painted white. Ouch. And so that hurts. Um, Tony Cartsonis and his crowd came in there and they stripped every single one of those walls. And our finished floors were underneath protective paper. All of that stuff happened on top. And like, and they came back later, and, they, and I'm not bragging about it, but they just basically said this literally was a make-or-break decision. They just said it allowed us so many more options and took the one trade that, I mean, everybody in the wood flooring industry knows. We come in and just, I mean, we're, we're, we're raining on everybody's parade. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like nobody can come in here. You can't, you know, and everybody needs to get in there all of a sudden. And so now that we're out of the way and we get to go through at, at a leisurely pace, I mean, at a sane pace, we're not working against a deadline. I mean, it's, it, it has made all the difference in the world. And I've used that same um, approach just about on all the work that I'm doing now. So you must cover everything just about 100% because of maybe – I worry when we when we would leave a job and cover it, we would want to do it because the builder, let's say, would just put a oh. runner. And then you come back and there's a color change, especially with the craft oh, yeah. oils. Uh, so you, you pretty much cover everything so there's none of that yeah. n- nonsense. Correct. And the other thing that you're guarding against is, yeah, you leave it to the contractor and, and you, know, you can stand there and say you know, there is to be no tape no tape of any type put on this finish. On the, I don't yeah. want to come back in here and see it. And I'll prom- you know, you and I know both know you, somebody's going to get down there. Well, this is curling. So I'm going to go ahead and put, put the blue tape, tape down or the white tape. And it's like, it ain't going to work folks. No, but it's I like your system work. because it, you must have a little bit of insurance in the back of your mind, even from watching with the way you did it. Part of my solution to this would be, well, let's say something does go a little awry with what you do and the way you do it. T- seems it would be, far easier to repair than trying to prepare some type of polyurethane film and stain and coloring where it's almost like the oils that you use, it'd probably be oh, yeah. a little easier and more forgiving. And it just looks, the one thing about those, those compound oils, they look fantastic. They, it looks like a really nice hand rub piece of furniture. Um, in some situations, I've used them. We couldn't use them because the traffic was just ridiculous. But what you're talking about something like you're doing, and I saw this up at the Breakers in Rhode Island, these multi, multi, multi million dollar mansions. It, it's not meant for people to come tracking through with their boots and and shoes. It's 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 a museum piece at that point in time. I think that affords right. you the opportunity to do exactly what you guys uh, do so well. Um, let me write, let me rifle through a few questions with you, and then. Um, if you didn't get into this, and it's hard to ask this question because you got in so early, what do you think you'd be doing if you didn't, you know, ride on your father's coattails and jump into flooring? Flying airplanes. In your career, in your in your whole bag of tricks, do you have a favorite tool? What's your favorite? If if you wouldn't give it away, if anybody asked, it, it's it's going to be in your will to somebody. Nobody is to touch it, to well, borrow it, to have it. You're not letting it go for anything. <laughs> Okay, well, here's, a little, here's a little here's a little story. When when we were young, when back when we were young, Red Devil made an inch and a half wood scrape, right. and it had it came up and it had the straight shaft, and it had a slight angle, and um, it was I don't know what kind of metal it was made out of, but. Where the blade, you're talking the larger inch and a half blade, hmm. you would screw it in, and at the base of it, there was, and it was where the the uh, scrape actually kind of made its angle cut. You could work with it for about, oh, I'd say a month and a half, and it would crack every single time. Okay. All right? So my dad, he just got fed up with this scrape breaking. So he took one, brand new one, and he took it to some metal shop and they made a cast of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then they poured, he must've had, I think he he probably had about 15 or 20 of these scrape blades or scrape, not blades, but the handle made out of cast aluminum. 
And I got one and he gave all of us, uh, you know, one when we were going in business, probably I probably had two or three. I've still got the original one that he gave me. Well, listen, Michael, I got to thank you for spending time with me here today. You're, you're a cool guy. I, I like catching up with people that know all these different things. I love sitting with the younger contractors and talking the meat and potatoes and the technical stuff and setting up jobs and things. It's not often you get to talk to somebody that has the historical background um, where, where the the true life of the flooring comes from, and it's what kind of keeps our industry going. And it, we've been through so many difficult times the last few years. It, it's really important that, one, we bring new people into this, but I think it's really important that they understand the history and where some of this comes from. And there's not always a really cool, you know, hardwood floor story historically. And you, we're going to talk another time because I this we've only touched on half your projects that I looked like, and there's a story in every single one of them. So uh, I I really appreciate your expertise and and the difference that you bring to everything. Uh, thank you for taking the time to sit here and talk with me today. Well, it's been my pleasure, and uh, I enjoyed it. And nice to see you and uh, talk with you about wood floors. Take care, Michael Perser. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, sir. I enjoyed it very much. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the All Things Wood Floor podcast. If you would like to see photos of some of the projects Michael and Steve talked about today, just go to woodfloorbusiness.com and enter Michael Purser, that's P-U-R-S-E-R, in the search box at the top of the homepage. And if you liked this episode, don't forget to subscribe to All Things Wood Floor to make sure you don't miss an episode.